Thanks. Ash. Hi. Hi, Vic. Ash Ashley is a copywriter who helps women find their authentic voices so they can weave it into their business and their branding and rise. She works for clients in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and the United States and South Africa. She grew up in South Africa during apartheid and is an imperfect ally and feminist. She runs the story team with her dog, Bella. Please welcome Ashley Rennie. Hi, everyone. Firstly, Charlotte, you are incredible for continuing through that. Um, yay! Good, good job. Um, I'm not sure if you could hear my dog, but she was barking in the background. So um, that's that was her. Um, thank you so much for having me. I am going to tell you a bit about myself and my story, and I'm hoping that you get something out of this today, um, with the theme being fearlessness. In 2019, I immigrated to London to be a performer. It was my dream to be cast in theatre shows in the West End and at the Globe and at the National. Little did I know that initially I'd spend my time here as a care worker. What follows is a deeply personal experience and I hope you get something from it, some motivation, some belief, because you really can do anything. I arrived in London and I threw myself into every single performing masterclass I could find. I networked as though my life depended on it. I was in dance classes, singing classes, acting classes every single day. I learned songs and monologues. I put myself in front of other performers and casting directors to be looked at and judged and exposed. And that's how much I wanted this thing. It's, it's how much I still want it. Theatre was the love of my life. It was my alpha and omega. It made me feel whole. It was the sole reason for my existence. I left my family, my friends, my country, everything I knew and loved to pursue a career in the city where theatre is in the marrow of the buildings and the streets and the people who frequent them. And then a pandemic happened. I had just been cast in my very first UK production, Carousel. The work had paid off. The dream was happening and poof, gone, finished, cancelled. For everyone though, right? It was a monumental moment. I also lost the job I had. So when you move to London from South Africa and you bring over your hard earned rands, you know you don't have the luxury of waiting for a theatre job to fall into your lap. One pound costs 22 rand. So I had been temping and working at a company as a quality controller. And I had money, right, until the 16th of March, 2020. What happened after that was something I never expected in my wildest dreams. If you told me I'd be working as a care worker in London at the age of 37, well, no, just no. <laughs> and yet I applied, I was accepted, I went through all the training, I took the tests, I studied, I filled out the forms, and I was a trained care worker what does this look like? For nine months, I visited people in their homes from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. I was up at 5.30 a.m. every single day. I lifted people, I helped them walk, I changed their nappies, I fed them, I clothed them, I bathed them, I cleaned their houses. Some of them were incredible and funny and kind and wise and delightful. They were grateful and they were excited to see me. They, they told me about their time in the war. They told me about their deceased partners. I visited a woman three times a week who, who I helped to bath and wash. She was alone for over a year because of the pandemic. She was also a chain smoker who believed that she never got ill because the cigarettes killed, killed the germs. I visited another woman sometimes three times a day who had suffered several strokes and who was incandescent with rage because she had no power in her life. She swore at me and the other carers. She screamed at us, she threw things at us. She tried to kick us and bite us. I sat with her once and I just asked her if she was okay. Uh, I asked her what she wanted. I asked her how I could help her. She told me she loved me. The next time she saw me, she told me to go back to South Africa where I belonged. She was racist beyond measure. And then she'd say something really funny and make me laugh. And I was so conflicted because 
I alternately disliked her and wanted her to like me at the same time. I put this down to my dysfunctional need to be adored by people in power. I briefly visited a gentleman with Alzheimer's who did not want me there and threatened to throw me out the window. I left and I never went back. I went to a man every morning at 7 a.m. for almost the full nine months. I would wake him up, wash him and dress him. He was as deaf as a doornail, so I'd spend 90 minutes every morning just yelling my head off. I made him breakfast and I made sure he took his pills. I cleaned his dishes and I made him tea. He always smiled. He always smiled, no matter what. Even if he was in hospital or after he'd been in hospital and he came home and no one exercised him for three weeks and he couldn't walk. Even when he fell and I caught him and I sat with him on the floor waiting for the ambulance, he smiled. When he could barely move and he could barely breathe, he smiled. He was my most regular customer. I loved him. He died just before I resigned. I went to a woman three times a day who had vascular dementia. I woke her up every morning and I put her on her SARA steady. This is a contraption with wheels for people who are immobile. And I moved her from her bed to her commode. I provided her personal care. I washed her whole body, covering her up as I went because she didn't want to be exposed. She had dementia, but she knew who I was. She called me darling. She made me laugh. I made her laugh. I sang to her. She had dementia, but she was more present and real and full of life than most people I've met. I loved her. Resigning was incredibly hard because of her, because she didn't want anyone else washing her. I was her carer. Those nine months were some of the hardest and most beautiful of my life. I knew that it was temporary. I knew that it wasn't my calling. And that's why I started my copywriting business at the same time. I was writing in my car between my care shifts. Um, I'd go and park in a parking lot up the road from one of my regular customers uh, twice, three times a day. And I'd keep the engine running in the freezing cold British winter. And I'd build my website and my portfolio. I'd pitch people, I'd finesse my CV, and I'd write for my very first clients. I was exhausted. It was a radical time. And I learned some things about myself that I didn't know. I have a very strong stomach. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I learned. I was, I was urinated on and defecated on more times than I can count. I cleaned toilets and sheets and body parts that we don't talk about in society. It was rough and I survived. So can you. I am physically stronger than I realized. I'm not a big person. I'm five foot five and I weigh about 54 kilos. I moved grown people all over their homes on walkers, wheelchairs, Sara steadies with my own weights. I am a rock star, so are you. What did it teach me about being fearless? Fear, fear stands no chance in the face of resilience. Resilience is something you can develop. It is something that you can learn and grow inside of yourself. The definition of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Um, toughness is another word for resilience. But real resilience, actual resilience, is far more complicated than that. It's much more nuanced. It can take many forms and shapes. It can be quiet. It can be fierce. It can be peppered with moments of sobbing in the fetal position after your 13th Zoom meeting of the day. Resilient people all seem to have the same things in common. Number one, they're self-aware. They know who they are and what they want. They can put down boundaries. They know their limits. Number two, mindfulness. They're aware of what they're sensing and feeling in any given moment, and that prevents them from shutting down or becoming overwhelmed. Number three, they practice self-care. Enough said. Number four, positive relationships. This one is huge. Um, resilient people look after their relationships. They gather people around them whom they trust, people they can look to for advice, people who make them laugh. And number five, they have a sense of purpose. They have a reason or a greater why. The care job put me under physical, emotional, and psychological strain. It challenged me to my limits. So starting a business, surely I could do it, right? 
Was I scared? I was terrified. Scared doesn't even begin to cover it. So why? Why was I so terrified? I'm educated. I'm relatively smart. I've been through hell in my life. Um, I've always got through that stronger. So why did I think that as a smart, educated woman who writes really well, that I wouldn't be able to start my own copywriting business and have it be successful? In preparing for the summit today, I thought a lot about the fear we feel as women and its origin. It's the origin that interests me because if women are experiencing fear all over the world, we all had it instilled in us, right? It goes beyond fear, this feeling we feel though. It's, um, it's like a deep lack. It's a deep lack of entitlement that I don't think men experience, at least not the men that I know. So I'm interested in looking at that origin, that origin of fear. So I want you to raise your virtual hand if you've ever heard this. You should smile more. Smile. You'd be so much cuter if you smiled. You're so loud. You're a good driver for a woman. Come on, give us a smile. You should embrace your natural gray hairs. Remember to smile. Men like women who smile. Your husband changes nappies. That's amazing. Get your husband to babysit. Are you a working mom? That must be so hard. Don't be so bossy. Don't wear that to school. You'll distract the boys. You're too ambitious. Women belong in the kitchen. Come and dance with me. Come on, let's dance. Why not? Why don't you want to dance with me? Come on, dance with me. Come on, dance with me. Let's just dance. Fine, you're such a bitch anyway. If women want to wear short skirts, they deserve to get raped. She was asking for it. She's a whore. Don't be a slut. No man wants to have sex with a virgin. How much did she have to drink that night? Well, what was she wearing that night? Why are you getting so emotional? You're such an attention whore. You're really bitchy. You're so dramatic. It must be that time of the month. You'd be really hot if you just made an effort. You'd be much hotter if you smiled. Is that all you're going to eat? You eat a lot for a woman. She doesn't want kids. Isn't she worried she won't be fulfilled? Her biological clock is ticking. You're not taking your husband's last name. Is she planning on working after the baby's born? She's going to let someone else raise her kid after she goes back to work. Does your husband mind that you make more money than him? Are you really fulfilled as a stay-at-home mom? She's too old to be doing another degree. What about starting a family? I know she's the most experienced person in the business who's done the most work, but we can't make a woman vice president. The other men wouldn't be comfortable with it. She's not just a pretty face. Oh, you work in mining. Are you a secretary? I know you're a partner in this board, meet board meeting, but can you please take the minutes and make the tea? Women are just better at that stuff. Women are sly. They're snakes. Women can't be trusted. We don't say these things about men. If we did, people would, I mean, they just look at us funny, right? Like we've lost our minds. Saying these things about women though is totally normal. And it starts young. We tell little girls what to wear. We punish girls for wearing things that might distract boys at school. Girls are taken out of class for wearing strappy tops and distracting boys. And so his education is prioritized over hers. We teach young girls that the burden of responsibility is on them. Girls mustn't tempt men. Girls mustn't tease men. Girls mustn't intimidate men. Don't distract the boys. Don't make the male teachers uncomfortable. We don't want the boys to target you or intimidate you. That skirt is too short. Your bra straps are showing. You have a nipple stand. Cover up. Don't be bossy. Don't be too loud. Don't make a scene. Don't answer all the questions in class. Don't be a know-it-all. Don't be a show-off. This sends an incredibly powerful message to children. We teach children that girls are dangerous and powerful and we sexualize their bodies and we teach boys to objectify and harass girls. It goes beyond this though. It speaks to a much deeper hatred of girls. Why do I say this? Boys have been banned from school for having hair that is too long or for dressing too effeminately. Why? because they look like girls and society hates girls. 
You scream like a girl. You run like a girl. Don't be such a girl. We hate girls. This messaging throughout my childhood and adolescence turned me into someone who wanted to be liked, who wanted to please, who couldn't say no, who wouldn't demand to be paid what I was worth, who was messaging my bestie at five o'clock in the morning in a total panic because what was I doing? How could I start a business? What right did I have? What did I know about anything? And then I started that business. And as part of my branding, I started creating content for women women who know what this feels like, women who are also struggling with a deep-seated fear that they just don't have the right to money, wealth, power, success. It's taken me 38 years to find my voice, and that's what starting my, my business in my car has done for me. And now I want to help other women find theirs. What's interesting is that the more I share my thoughts and beliefs about feminism and the strength of women, the better my business does. I was very fearful of putting myself out there as part of my business. I was fearful of marketing myself. I was fearful of saying, my name is Ashley and I'm a copywriter who is also a feminist and who wants to help women find their voices in their businesses. And then I published a blog about three months ago that has brought me more exposure and more work than I could possibly have imagined. It's taught me the importance of being fearless in authenticity and in my authentic brand voice. It's brought in clients and it's made me stand out in my niche, which has increased my revenue. The blog is on my website. It's about something pretty awful that happened to me on a train one night. Um, it's a very private story. And I, and I really questioned whether I should publish it or not, but publishing it was the best thing that I ever did. And it's taught me that being authentic in your business is one of the most important things you can do as part of your marketing campaign. So the things that I have learned in my life as a woman are these. Resilience can be built and it smashes fear in the face. Facing the fear of being authentic and being authentic in a way that is true to you will bring you success in your business. And the final thing that I've learned, and I will leave you with this, is that if you see a nurse or a care worker in the shops or on a train, say thank you. Let them in ahead of you in the queue at the shops or at the bank. They're scared and they're tired. They're tired in a way that's inconceivable, particularly during this time. Thank you, Sharla, for having me and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, thank you so awesome. much. Well, if there's anything you wanna share in the, in the uh, chat, Ashley, as to how the ladies can uh, connect with you, I know I sent out with the agenda today, everybody's email addresses and websites and all that great stuff. And I encourage everyone um, to you know stay in touch with all the great speakers today. So I'm gonna introduce our next amazing speaker, Sandra. So Sandra, if you want to turn on your sound and video, and if you want to um, start working on getting your PowerPoint going, and I'm going to uh, introduce you. Sandra Wallace is an OCD coach and registered psychiatric nurse. Sandra has 28 years of experience.